let's move on to look at my lipids. A little bit of red here, but there's some interesting history that I want to show you guys as well. Total cholesterol, 246 milligrams per deciliter. LDL, 164 milligrams per deciliter. This is the lowest LDL that I've had probably in the last four years, four plus years. Uh, when I was on a strict carnivore diet and zero carbohydrate diet, my LDL went to three, 400 milligrams per deciliter. I'm not convinced that's a bad thing. I think it has to do with human lipid metabolism and energy metabolism, which I'll talk about in a moment. I've remained insulin sensitive throughout that entire time. And my HDL is now 65. My triglycerides are 65 for a triglyceride to HDL ratio of one. Um, and that is actually a very valuable set of lipids. You don't need to get an MR. You don't need particle counts, in my opinion. I think really what you need to know is just these things. I think that LDL is a very poor predictor of cardiovascular risk. And as I will talk about in a moment, I think that the context by which you are viewing that LDL is the most important piece of it. And that elevated quote unquote LDL is not necessarily a problem if you are insulin sensitive, though many in the lipid space will provide study after study to say, look, there's a very strong relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease. And then they will leave out the studies that show that that relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease is attenuated massively in people who are insulin sensitive. One way you can tell that you're insulin sensitive, one proxy is a high HDL and low triglycerides. I talked about this on the Joe Rogan experience a couple of years ago. I showed Framingham study data looking at different levels of HDL as a stratification for LDL and cardiovascular risk, what you saw was that people with the highest levels of HDL had essentially no relationship between LDL, cholesterol, and cardiovascular risk. L HDL in that situation was a proxy for insulin sensitivity or low HDL being a proxy for insulin resistance. But you can see that my HDL remains high, my triglycerides remain low, and my triglyceride to HDL ratio is one. That's where it's kind of stayed throughout my history. When my HDL goes up, my triglycerides are often a little higher, but it's stayed in this range throughout my history. If you guys have followed me for some time, you know that when I went on Joe's podcast, I talked about an LDL of 500. I want to show you guys that one. That was actually my last blood work, though I've had a couple of finger stick lipid panels since then that showed the LDL declining. Now, at that time, I was eating honey. And interestingly, I think that that LDL may have also been related to a very strenuous workout that I did a few days before I got that blood work. So this is my blood work from July, let's see here, July, 2020. So two years ago, um, I'll get to the hormones later. The um, cholesterol, you can see there, the total cholesterol was 647, triglycerides 108, HDL 90, LDL cholesterol 533. Again, I was eating honey at the time, so I'm not quite sure why the LDL was so massively high. I was not eating a lot of fruit at this time, just honey. You can see that the LDL particle count was high. Small LDL, which I'll talk about in a moment, was very high. My LDL size was massive. I've never seen somebody with an LDL of 24.7 nanometers. But as I will mention more in a moment, I actually don't think small particles and LDL size are much of a cardiovascular disease risk marker when you are insulin sensitive, or they're just an indicator that you might be insulin resistant in a lot of people, but doesn't work that way for everyone. So I have a lot of LDL particles because I have a lot of LDL. They're big LDL. And so big LDL gives you a large LDL milligram per deciliter number, but I still have a lot of LDL particles because that number was so big. Again, I'm not exactly sure why that number was so big at the time because I was eating carbohydrates, but I think that when many people saw that, they attacked me saying I had familial hyperlipidemia. In the cholesterol podcast from a few weeks ago, I went into more detail about familial hypercholesterolemia. I do not have familial hypercholesterolemia. I've had LDLs that are much lower. I've had LDLs in the 140s or even the 120s in the past. And this LDL is 164, eating carbohydrates and fruit and honey. Um, so there's really no evidence that I have familial hypercholesterolemia at all. But what I did have was one instance where my LDL went very high when I was eating honey exclusively. It may have been related to something else. Nevertheless, the LDL came down. The cholesterol is very variable and will be affected based on when you last ate. This was They were both fasting blood draws and also what is in your diet. So what do we know about LDL? We know that 
when you are eating more saturated fat, LDL tends to go up a little bit, not to 500, but LDL does go up a little bit when you're eating saturated fat, which is probably why my LDL is 164 now. When you eat seed oils, your LDL goes down, but as I'll show you guys later in the podcast, and I've shown this study many times, when you eat seed oils, your LDL goes down, but your LP little a, which is essentially a measure of oxidized phospholipids as well as oxidized LDL, which is a direct measure of oxidized phospholipids on LDL. Those both go up when you eat seed oil. So I think that using LDL as a metric of cardiovascular risk is short-sighted and myopic. And that is basically what I'll say about that. I don't think it's something to worry about. If you are insulin sensitive, you must get that fasting insulin. But how many of these doctors who are worried about your slightly elevated or moderately elevated LDL on an animal-based diet are getting a fasting insulin. I think all too few, unfortunately. So let's go back to my lipid panel here. You can see that, um, of course, they're going to say my non-HDL cholesterol is low. That's just a calculated number. And then I got an NMR. So you can see here, my ApoB is also going to be high because my LDL is high. And as you know, if you listen to the lipids cholesterol podcast I did a few weeks ago, ApoB is on LDL, also VLDL and other uh, apolipoproteins. So this is just reflecting the fact that I have a quote high LDL. Again, I don't worry about that. I'll come back to the LP little a in a moment. My peak LDL size is smaller now, 218.1. Again, when I look into LDL size, what I find is that when you adjust for insulin sensitivity, LDL size is simply a metric, a predictor of increased cardiovascular risk because it predicts insulin resistance. They're saying my uh, LDL size is too low, but you can see here that I missed the cutoff by 0.1 angstroms. So they would probably put me in the moderate range of peak LDL size. But again, as an insulin sensitive individual, I think that the value of an LDL size goes out the window because we know that I am insulin sensitive. There's no risk of insulin resistance when I have a fasting insulin of 2.4 and a hemoglobin A1C of 5.2. So the LDL particles, this is actually a number in an animal per liter. This is counting the number of particles rather than this LDL number, which is milligrams per deciliter, the 164 versus uh, 1,925 LDL particles. Again, it's going to be high because I have high quote unquote LDL milligrams per deciliter. I don't care. Uh, my LDL phenotype is pattern A. I want to talk about that as well in a moment, but that means that the majority of my particles are large and buoyant. And again, this LDL phenotype is mostly an indicator of insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. So there's a lot of redundancy in these things. And if you are insulin sensitive, meaning in my opinion, in L, uh, fasting insulin of less than five, preferably less than three, None of this really matters. I think that there's very scant, I don't think there's a good case that can be made with the literature to suggest that your LDL is an increased cardiovascular risk when you are insulin sensitive. It's gonna say that I have small LDL that's high and medium LDL that's high. But again, this is just because I have a large number of LDL particles and every distribution, every human has a semi-Gaussian, which is a bell curve distribution of LDL particles. Some are gonna be small, some are gonna be medium, it's gonna be large. And so if you have more LDL particles, you're probably gonna trigger the flag on almost every blood work saying that you have increased small dense LDL. But again, when you look at insulin sensitivity first, none of these numbers mean much of anything. And this is all to say that in my strong opinion, and I would love to debate and have a reasonable conversation with anyone about this, I have an LDL pattern of A, I'm very insulin sensitive, and I don't think there's any increased or any case to be made for an increased cardiovascular risk with a small LDL or a medium LDL here. Uh, you can see ApoA1, which is the apolipoprotein, on uh, HDL, they're flagging my large HDL saying it's low. Again, I'm right at the top of their range. I missed it by a very small amount. I think that this is, again, something I wouldn't worry about at all because I'm super insulin sensitive. So that is basically my summary of my lipid panel. There's a little bit of history there that I discussed as well, but I want to dive into a little bit more of the context there. I don't want to rehash the lipid episode that I did for fear this will become an onerous podcast in my blood work. I don't want it to be a three-hour podcast, but I think it's important to consider that hyperinsulinemia is an independent risk factor for ischemic heart disease. And if you look at the relative risks in a lot of these studies, hyperlipidemia, excuse me, hyperinsulinemia is by far the best predictor of ischemic heart disease, much better predictor than LDL. And yet 
everyone just focus on L, focuses on LDL and very few people are looking at hyperinsulinemia as a contextual variable here. And studies like this are critically important not to ignore. February 12, 2001 from JAMA, low triglycerides, high high density lipoprotein, cholesterol, and the risk of ischemic heart disease. I talked about this study before. So men with conventional risk factors for ischemic heart disease, this would probably be an elevated LDL, have a low risk of ischemic heart disease if they have low triglycerides and high HDLC levels. That's what people like Dave Feldman would call the triad, a triad of metabolic health. And when you look at those people, you really cannot make an argument that they are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease with their quote unquote elevated LDL. And I will say this to be very clear. I think being myopically focused on LDL is a mistake that is harming people. They get put on statins, they get put on other lipid lowering drugs, and they remove some of the most nutrient rich foods in their diet. So why does LDL go up on these type of diets? As I hinted at earlier, I think there are two major reasons that your LDL may rise on an animal-based diet. It's important to note that an animal-based diet includes carbohydrates and the new Carnivore MD website is going to be up uh, very soon. It's carnivoremd.com. Right now it's still the old one, but on the new one, we're going to have a calculator. Okay. We're going to have a calculator to help you guys get macros, just a basic framework for structuring an animal-based diet in terms of your macros, how many carbohydrates, et cetera. So an animal-based diet has carbohydrates, but a lot of people do phases where they have low carbohydrates. Again, I'm not a fan of this, but I think there's some good evidence that when you do a low carbohydrate diet, there is a rise in LDL due to mm, the metabolism of lipids and something called the lipid energy models. This is an interesting paper. It's an opinion paper, a hypothesis paper published by Dave Feldman and a few others from May of 2022. Um, my friend, uh, Tommy Wood contributed this paper as well, but basically if you read this paper, what you will find is that the main contributor here is that there is energy. And if you are fueled by fat, meaning you don't have a lot of carbohydrates coming into your system, there is an increased efflux, meaning uh, an export of VLDL containing particles from the liver. And that's going to lead to a higher LDL. So I think that there's some really interesting correlations that happen, and you can show this, and Dave's work has shown this pretty clearly, that when you decrease carbohydrates, your LDL will go up. Now, this is probably a uh, an evolutionary adaptation to ketogenic diets for humans. Certainly, we had periods where hunts were unsuccessful, where we couldn't find honey or fruit. This is part of the ketogenic physiology. I don't think it's a negative thing. You're going to remain insulin sensitive, but this explains part of the rise. I would say the majority of the rise in LDL in many humans is that they have low carbohydrates in their diet. So if you are seeing LDLs of three or 400 milligrams per deciliter in your blood work, chances are you're low carbohydrate or you're very low carbohydrates. You're getting less than hundred grams of carbohydrates a day. So increase your carbohydrates and your LDL will come down. I've seen that pattern for myself. Now my LDL remains 164, which is perhaps 20% higher than most people would like to see it. And I think that has to do with saturated fat and something called the homeoviscous model, I think is the most compelling hypothesis that I have seen for that uh, thus far.